We want to bless the name of the living God for yet another opportunity to be part of this awesome meeting. I want to thank the chairman for giving me space to share a few thoughts with us. He has set the stage where I can comfortably continue. But the bar has already been raised high. I pray for grace. Amen. Eunice, thank you very much for singing to us Thy Kingdom Come. What we have been assigned to discuss with us is entitled Righteousness, the Kingdom, the Authority of the Kingdom. Righteousness, the Authority of the Kingdom. And if you listen to the lyrics of the song Eunice just sang to us, Say Thy Kingdom Come. Then the psalmist is expecting that as it is in heaven, we should observe it here. So where is thy reign of peace and purity and love? After having prayed thy kingdom come, he doesn't see it. When shall hate, all hatred cease as in the realms above? So if you go to heaven, there's no hatred. And then when comes the promised time that war shall be no more and last oppression crime shall cease shall flee thy face before so righteousness the authority of the kingdom when our dear chairman was ending his presentation this morning some of the quotations i just want to bring to the fore before we continue romans 10 14 says for christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the church to which we all belong, there is something unique about it, and that word is righteousness. Then Ephesians 4.24 says, and to put on the new salt, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness. So it means there might be suspicious righteousness. There might be tainted something. We'll look at those things true righteousness and holiness and then the Luke 1 75 in holiness and righteousness before him all days so when Jesus was teaching us about the Lord's prayer Matthew 6 10 says your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so what, can, what are we praying for then Paul comes to explain in Romans 14, 17 that for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, dancing and enjoying our thought, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It means when you pray, let your kingdom come. After the prayer, these are the things we want to see. Not the material things, not the names, but we want to see some. Let your kingdom come as it is in heaven. There is no lust there, there is no hatred there. We want to see righteousness, the authority of the kingdom. David A. Bednar, a theologian, has said receiving the authority of the priesthood by the laying on of hands is an important beginning but it is not enough ordination confers authority but righteousness is required to act with power as we strive to lift souls to teach and testify to bless and counsel and to advance the work of salvation. So, the discussion will focus around this quote. There are four words we're looking at. Authority is there, ordination is there, righteousness is there, and power. So, ordination is the process by which individuals are consecrated. That is set apart and elevated from the laity class to the clergy. So, all of us, have been ordained in one way or the other, have been set apart from the others. 
And then authority is the right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Power is the ability or right to control people and events, or to influence the way people act or think in important ways. In Ephesus, we say power is the rate of doing work, or at which work is done within a specified time. So when you put all these things together, what Bernard is trying to say is, one, by virtue of our calling and ordination, we have authority. We have the right to mount the podium. We have the right to bless marriages. But we can't do certain things for power to cause the needed effects if we are ungodly. You can say all that I want to say on the pulpit, but when you are confronted with an issue to put your feet down and take decisions and you are not a righteous person, you shy away. So according to him, one can have the authority, the right, the space to act, but may not be able to demonstrate the power that will cause effect simply because he may be living in sin. We need both power and authority, the rights and the ability. And for him, when you become a minister, you have been given the authority, the right. But to teach the people the principles of God, for them to follow and become the righteousness of God, the leader ought to be righteous himself or herself. So Luke 9 verse 1. Jesus sent the twelve together and he gave them both power and authority. So he gave them the right and the ability. So that when they speak, the demons will say that yes, we have met the righteous people. They are standing in the stead of the almighty God. So without righteousness, there will be no power from the Holy Spirit. As 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, we have a form of godliness, but the power will not be there. Dearly beloved, in our discussions, I'll try to explain or define what righteousness means by trying to let us understand the Hebrew and the Greek words. I'll not go into details. But I've structured the presentation under maybe five or six thematic areas. If time or space, time gives me the space, I'll complete. Otherwise, I'll put a comma. And when we meet somewhere, I'll end with a full stop. We'll look at the scepter of the kingdom of God. Biblical perspectives on righteousness. Righteousness in relation to integrity crisis in the church. Righteousness and religious hypocrisy dishonesty and duplicity righteousness and justice and with our space we'll consider some four men god said these men are righteous if you meet them me myself i'm coming to destroy and punish and i see these people i'll bypass them job noah and daniel and then maybe we'll draw some conclusions from there Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 says but of the son he said your throne O God is forever and ever Hebrews 1 8 and 9 the scepter of uprightness or righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom you loved righteousness and hated wickedness righteousness as opposed to wickedness therefore God your God has anointed you with oil of gladness beyond your companions. The scepter of the kingdom of God. A scepter is a ceremonial staff used by kings. Ornament, ornamental rod or staff borne by rulers on ceremonial occasions as emblem of authority and sovereignty. If you go into the Bible, scepter usually stands for authority. 
Esther chapter 8 verse 4 tells us that when the king wanted Esther to approach, he stretched for the scepter on her and that gave her the right to approach the king. So scepter stands for authority or what a group of people stand for. In Ghana, our clans and respective traditional rulers have their scepters with emblems or totems signifying their authority and relevance. For instance, the Kwana people, the symbol is buffalo, standing for honesty and uprightness. So the stick, the staff could be anything, but what caps it? Tell us who the, 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 what they stand for or who the person is. The Ayukwas one is the falcon. It stands for statesmanship, patience, and bravery. Then the Asuna, statesmanship, and then patriotism. This is the crow. And then the Aguna is parrot. So if we use parrot, it's eloquence and perfect management. Then in Ghana, our coat of arms, what is written under it is freedom and justice. It means those in authority must govern with this at the back of their mind. So if we sit on the throne and we struggle to experience freedom and justice in the nation, you don't fit to sit there. God, that throne stands for something. If you go to the parliament, so whenever the, 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 the speaker of parliament is coming, we have something we call the mace. It's a symbol of authority of parliament. And it's entrusted into the speaker. So before the speaker sits, the mashah comes leading him with a mace on his shoulder. So when the speaker sits and then he puts the mace inside something and it stands upright, then they can do parliamentary business. His staff gives him the authority. And I didn't have time to go in. We have a lot of Adinkra symbols weaved around the staff, telling him how he should conduct himself. If the Speaker of Parliament walks in here, he can sit anywhere, but we can't conduct parliamentary proceedings. But if they decide to come and use this auditorium for parliamentary activities, they have to come with their staff. Once the mace enters, we know Parliament has sat. That's why after elections, we are going to inaugurate the president and they come to, onto a park, Independence Square, whatever, until if the staff doesn't come, it can't be considered. But when the speaker is coming, what are you identified with as a Christian? A new community has been created from the Jews and the Gentiles called the church. And our ruler hated evil and loved righteousness and we pray that that kingdom should come and we have put his name on us much as there are many subtitles in the material world in the kingdom of god i want to announce to somebody that our symbol our totem what defines us is righteousness if the church doesn't live right it becomes a santifoku, becomes a crapping foku, becomes a man mama, it becomes a daddy, it becomes Chelsea. But when righteousness is in the system, say that is the authority and the power we have. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 12. King Solomon is trying to advise us. It is an abomination before God. For kings to do evil, we are all royal priesthood. For the throne is established in righteousness. So Solomon is telling us that any king who sits on the throne in Israel, he or she dare not and cannot commit sin. Because the seat on which he sits to rule is established in righteousness. And I will say, kings detest wrongdoing. Something they frown on. It can't come near them. 
So for King Solomon, any leader, any ruler, any person who thinks God has called him to lead a group, his leadership ought to be identified with righteousness. Otherwise, he doesn't fit. Righteousness is our authority. Somebody do this. Righteousness is our authority. If you want to see our nation changed, if you want to see our members living righteous lives, if you want to see corruption eradicated, permit me to say, stand from the pulpit. We are producing the type of Christians we are seeing. Because when we lift our hands, sometimes they are tainted. You want to correct somebody, and at the back of your mind, you realize that you don't fit. You can't say what you ought to say on Samagogo. There is no authority. You don't have power. So King Solomon tells us in Proverbs 25 verse 5, Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. So kings should not entertain evil in their presence. And then 29 verse 4, Proverbs says, By righteousness a king builds up the land. But he who exacts gifts or bribes tears the kingdom out. Dearly beloved in the Lord, as people in constant relationship with God, we are expected to live lives that conform to God's will, His standards, mercy, and justice. It is when we live in godliness that we can exercise spiritual and moral authority and power to be able to correct the world of its injustices and cruelty. We're almost 3,000 here. Coming from our 468 different denominations. We preach on every Sunday, sometimes Friday all night. But on Monday from 4 a.m. when our members go to work, what do we see? God have mercy. Biblical perspectives on righteousness. Scanning through the Bible, I met righteousness has been mentioned about 500 times. And somebody has said that if the Bible says something once, pay attention. If it says it twice, pay more attention. But with ours, it is 500 times. In the Old Testament, two words were used to represent righteousness. The theologians are here, permit me if I pronounce it wrongly. Chadik and Chedekar. The Chadik just means right natural or moral sense. Right in natural or moral sense. Something being right. Aligning with how God ordained it and how God sees it in the natural, moral, or legal sense. So in the Old Testament, when they use the Chadik, it's like God ordained that man, one man, one woman, should marry. 